Thank you all for enduring my long biography. I'm really grateful to Stephen and all his staff and volunteers for having me here. Um, it's a fantastic conference. Uh, so many interesting speakers. I'm really thrilled to be on the, the agenda with distinguished scientists such as James Hansen and amazing advocates and authors such as David Walinga, who was here on stage with me last night, and also Carrie Gillum, who I think is, may already have spoken. So, see if I can master the... Uh, there we go. How are we doing? Yes? Good, thank you. Okay, all right. So what I'm gonna talk about is how we created the system of meat production that we have today, which for anyone who's a meat eater, plays such a large role in all of our diets and lives, and even for those who are not meat eaters, influences so many of the consumer products that permeate our society that have a meat origin. And this is a question that, as you could hear in my bio, I've been kind of obsessed with for a number of years. I've been writing about antibiotic resistance for at least 10 years now and two books of my three. And uh, I came to this story of the influence of antibiotics in agriculture through writing about the problem of antibiotic resistance in medicine and coming to understand that our use of antibiotics in livestock dwarfs what we use in medicine every year. So it turns out that our modern system of producing the meat that we eat owes its existence to two things to antibiotics, and to chickens. So antibiotics are the foundation of modern meat production. Since the 1950s, all around the world, we've been feeding livestock tiny doses of antibiotics on most days of their lives, not to cure them from diseases, which is the way we use antibiotics in humans, but to make livestock grow more quickly and to protect them against diseases that arise in crowded barns and feedlots. We do that for cattle, we do it for pigs, but we did it first in chickens. In effect, poultry taught the rest of meat agriculture how to misuse antibiotics. And in some parts of the world, chicken and chicken producers are reversing that historic mistake and teaching the rest of livestock agriculture how to back away from overuse of antibiotics. So I'm gonna take us through that history because it's a story that contains so many mistakes that we still make today. Mistakes of trusting too much in technology, of failing to ask questions of science, of assuming there's only one path to progress, and especially of taking things for granted. And in this story, the thing that we take for granted the most is antibiotics. And there's a thing that I think we all forget, which is that antibiotics are a pretty recent arrival. Depending on when you start counting, the antibiotic era begins either in 1928 when Alexander Fleming leaves a window open in his laboratory in London and penicillium mold wafts in and contaminates the culture plates he's working on. Or in 1941, when the compound secreted by that mold, the first natural penicillin, gets given to a human for the first time. But either way, the antibiotic era is not that old. It's either 90 years old or 77 years old. It is within longer than the lifetimes of everyone in this room. And so for us, antibiotics have always been there. We have no sense of how extraordinary and how precious they are because we've never had to live without them. We've forgotten what our grandparents knew, which is that life without antibiotics without guaranteed protection from the ravages of infection, was often tragic and was always uncertain. In the time of our grandparents and our great-grandparents, surgery and childbirth and accidents, it was routine for them to be fatal. 
So were random injuries, childhood illnesses, and as this 1930 advertisement from a magazine shows you, something as simple as cutting yourself while shaving could put you in the hospital with a fatal infection. So we're now running up against the unintended consequences of failing to treat antibiotics with the seriousness that they deserve. Worldwide, the power of, antibiotic resist of antibiotics is failing against resistance. The former Secretary General of the United Nations called antibiotic resistance the greatest and most urgent global threat. The Chief Medical Officer of the United Kingdom has said that antibiotic resistance is as serious a threat to society as terrorism. And the former head of the CDC here in the US refers to the bacteria that become resistant as nightmares. We're losing the power of antibiotics because by misusing them and overusing them, we've allowed the bacterial world to adapt to them. And one of the most important ways that we've done that is in agriculture. So I'm going to tell you the story of how that happened. It begins with this chap. He is a scientist named Thomas Jukes. He was an emigre from England. He migrated through Canada to the United States. He became an expert in the dietary needs of chickens. And on Christmas Day, 1948, he walked into his laboratory, which was not very far from here, outside New York City, to check the results of an experiment. He was working for a pharmaceutical firm named Letterly Laboratories that had just made one of the first antibiotics, the first of the tetracycline class, a drug called chlorotetracycline. So Jukes had set up what was kind of a traditional experimental design. He had taken a bunch of just hatched baby chickens, and he divided them up into groups. And he wanted to test the power of dietary supplements for livestock. So to each of those groups, he gave some supplement that was on the market at the time. Vitamins, cod liver oil, brewer's yeast. And to one group, he gave the dried, ground up remains of the manufacturing waste from making his company's drug. When he weighed the, chi the chicks a few weeks later on Christmas Day, he did it himself because he'd given his lab tech the day off for the holiday, he discovered that the birds who'd received the antibiotic leftovers weighed more than any other bird in the experiment, twice as much as birds that got what was the standard diet for chickens at the time. Jukes called this effect growth promotion. And he realized pretty quickly, though he didn't admit to it for a while in public, that what was creating the effect was tiny doses of his company's antibiotic, which was left behind in the manufacturing waste when the drug was strained out and bottled for sale. And with that recognition, he created a new industry. In just five years, farmers in the United States went from giving their, antibiotic, their, their livestock no antibiotics at all to giving them 500,000 pounds a year. And today, just in the US, the total use of antibiotics is more than 30 million pounds a year. And across the world, the total is believed to be more than 260 million pounds on a global average, at least twice as much antibiotic going into livestock as being given to people to cure infections. And here's the important point about this. Unlike in human medicine, almost none of the antibiotics going into livestock are going to them to cure illness. These animals are not sick. The drugs are being given to them for Jukes's effect of growth promotion and also to protect them from catching diseases in crowded barns and feedlots. The reason that's important is that whenever we use an antibiotic, in agriculture or in medicine, we're taking a risk that bacteria will adapt to the drugs. We balance that risk against the benefit of curing an infection. When we cure the infection, the risk is worthwhile. When there is no infection present, we tip the balance of that equation entirely over to the risk of encouraging resistance. And that's what we've been doing for decades when we give antibiotics routinely to the animals that we eat.
So I came out of doing, to, to doing this work out of a couple of years of talking to people about the impact of antibiotic resistance in medicine, talking to physicians and researchers, people who had drug-resistant infections, families of children who did not survive infections. And I was shocked by how casually we were using antibiotics in agriculture when medicine exerts such tight control. And I wanted to know, where did, where did this come from? How did we get here? To answer that question, it turned out I had to go back to the beginning of the antibiotic era, which happens to be the end of World War II. So Fleming's penicillin, to give you a bit of history, is the first antibiotic. And its first wide use is on the battlefields of World War I. It gets given, rolled out in 1943. And because of that drug, hundreds of thousands of soldiers and sailors come home at the end of the war who otherwise would have died. When it's rolled out to civilians on the open market a year or two later, people who would have died terrible lingering deaths from infection are saved in days. Sometimes it seems like they're cured in hours. There's a reason why antibiotics were called initially the miracle drugs. Their effect seemed like a miracle. So right after penicillin comes streptomycin and chloramphenicol and Jukes' tetracycline, followed by a, uh, another tetracycline made by Pfizer really quickly all the foundational drugs of the antibiotic era, all by 1948. There is crazy enthusiasm for them. That renders them both a public good and also for those manufacturers an instant huge moneymaker. And manufacturers' desire to squeeze just a little more profit out of this magic new product dovetails in a really interesting way with other things that are going on at the end of World War II. So during the war, the meat industry was encouraged by governments to spool up production as much as possible to feed all those millions of soldiers and sailors deploying all around the world. But when the war was over, that guaranteed market went away. And that left the meat industry with all this new infrastructure that they had built out and no sales that were guaranteed to them by the military coming back to compensate them for that investment. And at the same time, because of the devastation of the war, there was a huge amount of concern about the food supply being more fragile than anyone had anticipated. If you think about it, arable land had been destroyed by battles, Flocks and herds had been decimated. There weren't even fishing fleets to take protein out of the ocean because so many fishing vessels had been co-opted by national navies to, to compensate for boats that had been sunk. There were crop failures in Europe and Asia, and even here in the US, there was what came to be called a meat famine. That was such an important news story that it actually played a role in the first election after the war in 1946. So, the food supply feels fragile. The food industry feels overextended. Their answer to both of those is to try to cut their costs, to retreat from the amount of, of infrastructure they had been supporting. Their easy answer to that is to start giving livestock cheaper feed. This is the moment at which we start raising livestock on grains instead of on pasture. In the case of chickens, the heroes of my story, or maybe the anti-heroes, they turn from giving them small pulverized fish, fish from the California coast, the subject of, of John Steinbeck's book, Cannery Row, to giving them instead grains. But grains don't have all the nutrition that chickens need. And therefore, they turn to looking for supplements to add back the nutrition they're missing. But the supplements have to be cheap. And that's what brings Jukes into his laboratory in 1948 on Christmas Day, and what spurs the enormous use of, of antibiotics in livestock from that moment and up till today. Jukes fed his birds, something that his company was going to throw away. It was literally money for nothing. And by the time antibiotics became expanded around the world, and they discovered that these doses were so small, grams per ton, 
it was a very inexpensive way to influence the growth of livestock from that point and up until today.